Travis Ross graduated from Northern Arizona University in 2015 with a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry. He worked for Maricopa County Environmental Services from 2017 to 2021 as a retail food inspector and briefly as an enforcement specialist. He joined ADHS in 2021 as the Marijuana Kitchen Inspector and became the supervisor for the Smoke-Free Arizona Cottage Food and Marijuana Kitchen programs in 2022. Perfect. Uh, Travis, if you want to um, unmute yourself and share your screen, hand it over to you. Here we go. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so um, like the introduction said, my name is uh, Travis Ross. I am the uh, supervisor over the, um, the cottage food program, the marijuana kitchen program, and the smoke-free Arizona program. Um, I will be going over um, some just general overview of the marijuana kitchen program, some updates, and then the same for the um, cottage food program as well. All right, so um, first we will uh, go over the marijuana kitchen program. So um, in 2010 was when Prop 203 or uh, the, um, the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act or uh, short uh, AMA was passed. This did allow the legal purchase and consumption of marijuana in Arizona um, as long as a qualified patient uh, received a prescription and a marijuana card from their um, from their doctor. Um, so once that did go into uh, play, um, if uh, someone did have a debilitating condition, there is a list on our website of the different uh, qualifying conditions that would allow someone to get a uh, medical marijuana card. Um, and then as of uh, uh, 2023, uh, we had just over 126,000 uh, current registered um, qualifying patients. Uh, and just under 200 uh, registered uh, dispensaries. Uh, so when I do say qualified patient, um, as of right now, there is no age limit. Uh, but with that, if they are under the age of 18, they are required to have a registered designated caregiver uh, to look over the patient and their consumption of marijuana. And then obviously it is under the discretion of the doctor as well as um, the patient's parents. Um, and all that, but um, they can be under 18 and uh, and get uh, be considered a qualified patient. Um, and then there are the uh, debilitating conditions that do allow an individual to um, apply to get a marijuana card. Um, and on our website, there is the ability to add um, continuing debilitating conditions that could then be considered in the future to then be added to that list uh, so that uh, individuals could apply. Um, so some of those debilitating conditions uh, are going to be like cancer, glaucoma, HIV, AIDS, hepatitis C, Crohn's disease, Alzheimer's. Um, it's it's called a cachexia or wasting syndrome, severe chronic pain, severe nausea, um, uh, seizures, and then per, uh, severe and persistent muscle spasms. So those are just some of the debilitating conditions. But if an individual does have any of those conditions, uh, they can speak with their doctor, get a, ma a medical marijuana card, um, and then they would be allowed to purchase uh, medical marijuana. Um, and then that did go into play in uh, 2010. And then in 2020, that was when uh, Prop 207, or the Smart and Safe Arizona Act, uh, was passed. And for short, it is uh, referred to as SASA. So this did allow individuals 21 years or older to purchase and consume uh, marijuana, uh, in their own personal um, homes. That is one of the major things is that even though marijuana is uh, legal in the state of Arizona, um, it is still illegal to consume it in any public place. It is still considered a petty offense. Um, so, uh, but uh, Sasa and AMA did legalize um, the consumption of marijuana if someone is in the privacy of their own home. Um, and to kind of get an idea of just recreational marijuana sales, last year it was approximated to be about $2 billion in just the state of Arizona. Um, and there are some uh, key differences when it does come to uh, the rules for medical marijuana versus recreational marijuana. Uh, at the beginning, when recreational marijuana was legalized, the testing requirements were slightly different. Medical marijuana did have a stricter testing regimen than recreational marijuana, but it was actually recently changed 
um, to now where they match up. And when I say changes, um, medical marijuana did not become more loose in their testing requirements, but recreational marijuana became more strict in their uh, testing requirements. And that was actually proposed by uh, stakeholders and uh, dispensary owners to avoid like confusion and all that. So uh, some of the other major uh, rules when it does come to medical marijuana versus recreational marijuana is medical patients, uh, they are allowed to buy up to two and a half ounces every 14 days. Um, whereas recreational uh, consumers are allowed to buy up to an ounce of marijuana a day. Uh, but then they are also subject to a 16% tax on um, on their marijuana. Uh, and then when it comes to edibles, uh, medical marijuana or medical marijuana recipients um, are allowed to receive edibles with a dosage as high as 1,000 uh, milligrams of THC. Uh, but then when it comes to adult use or recreational marijuana, uh, the individual package cannot exceed more than 100 milligrams of THC. Um, and then each individual serving size, so that can be an individual gummy, a piece of chocolate. If it's a drink, it can be a serving portion of that drink. Each individual serving size cannot be more than 10 milligrams of THC. All right, so THC or tetrahydrocannabinol is the uh, main psychoactive compound in marijuana that gives that uh, gives people that feeling of being high. Uh, it um, it bonds with uh, cannabinoid receptors mostly in in the brain. They're referred to as CB1 and CB2, um, and it's the binding of THC to these receptors that give um, the effects of of marijuana, whether that is positive or negative. Um, so some of the effects that people strive for, whether that is they're taking it recreationally or they're trying to take it to um, help with a medical condition can be like a feeling of euphoria, lower levels of stress, um, suppressed nausea, increased appetite. Um, and it can, it can also be used as a, um, uh, a pain suppressor. So obviously, you know, people can use it for recreation and and enjoy it, but then it can definitely be seen as um, an alternative uh, medicine for those um, individuals that um, have a medical marijuana card. And then um, depending on the individual and how they react uh, with uh, THC, they can actually have some uh, negative effects. Uh, those can be seen as um, anxiety, panic attacks, paranoia, increased heart rate and um, uh, potentially even fluctuations in blood pressure. Um, it is, uh, there, there's not much in the way of, of studies that can show um, negative effects, but it is still strongly recommended that um, pregnant women do not consume THC um, because there is some potential suggestion that um, exposure to THC uh, of the fetus can um, actually negative affect their ability to learn language, uh, their attention, behavior, and possible uh, growth restrictions. But again, those are definitely, um, it's it's more loose evidence than anything, but it is still uh, recommended that pregnant women do not consume uh, THC. Um, and then when it does come to um, small children, uh, they will definitely, they will have a, um, a worse reaction to THC. And in most cases, uh, they will consume it unknowingly. Uh, when it comes to marijuana and marijuana edibles, they are mostly candies and things that are going to be uh, more desirable to children. Uh, so in the few cases that uh, children have gotten into um, THC um, edibles, they will eat a large amount and then their body will be exposed to a large amount of THC for an average adult. So for a small child, um, they're dealing with an even higher, um, higher dose of THC for um, their small body. So it, they can have as, as little effects as being like extremely drowsy. Uh, but when it comes to these high levels of THC, they can have um, as, se as severe effects as like low blood pressure, slowed breathing, uh, potentially to the point where they would need a ventilator and then potentially even go into a coma. All right, so THCA or tetrahydrocannabinolic acid is the precursor to THC. Um, so the main way to get THC from THCA um, is uh, it's called decarboxylization or decarbing. 
Uh, this is adding heat to THCA. It will get rid of that carboxyl group that's uh, circled in red right there. It'll break that off and then it will turn into THC, which then can bind, uh, can bind to the uh, cannabinoid receptors in the human body. Uh, this takes place uh, roughly anywhere between 230 and 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, decarbing. So the THCA is going to be that um, those crystals that are on the outside of the actual flower. So that this is why um, an individual can't just eat a marijuana plant or eat in a marijuana flower and feel the um, the normal effects is because it's covered with that THCA and it needs to be converted to THC. So adding heat to the to the flower, whether that is lighting it on fire um, or cooking it, will decarb it. So if someone lights the flower on fire, it will decarb the THCA to THC. They breathe in that smoke, and then that's where they get the effects. Um, and then when it comes to cooking it, this will be more of a um, when it comes to edibles or may, uh, potentially even making concentrates. So uh, a lower volume way of cooking would be to submerge the the flour in either oil or butter and then that is cooked until the th uh, until the THC has been decarbed and then um, that oil or butter is then infused with THC the flour is then strained off and then any products that are made with that oil or butter would then be um, infused with THC uh, but then on a little bit more of a high volume process that we see at most of the manufacturing facilities is going to be um, an extraction process. So it uh, they use a mixture of um, a solvent mixed with pressure and heat to then decarb and actually extract that THC um, in a, a liquid form from the actual plant. So the life cycle of a commercial marijuana plant. So um, once the plant is grown, there's a few different pathways it can take. So um, the flower is uh, is then harvested and dried. Once it is dried, it can be sold as the flower. Um, a lot of facilities will take any loose scraps and uh, make pre-rolled uh, marijuana cigarettes. Um, but then, it, um, but then it can also be. Uh, the a distillate can be extracted from the actual um, plant and it can uh, be turned into any like uh, a different number of concentrates. So wax, shatters, uh, tinctures, which is just an oil with a dropper, um, vape, vape liquids, um, and then any other type of edibles. Um, another method that uh, is used, maybe not so, so much is um, it's called bubble hash or ice water hash. This is where the dried flour is ground up, put into ice water, and then it is uh, strained. The THCA will break off of the actual flour, and then it is concentrated. So that's what that um, picture is on the bottom right. That is um, bubble hash, so that is then um, smoked. So um, the two uh, major um, paths that it can take is uh, staying in its flour form, so whether that is being sold as flour, pre-rolls, bubble hash, if it's uh, it can be mixed in with a concentrate or what have you. Um, and then this is a very basic diagram of the extraction process um, that we see at a lot of facilities. So like I did say, they use a, um, a solvent and a mixture of pressure and heat to actually extract and decarb that THC from the actual plant. So one of the more common solvents that we see is used is butane. Um, it will all be in that solvent tank. The material tank will be filled with the dried flour. The solvent will then be mixed in with the uh, material. Um, a mixture of heat and pressure will then be applied. And then um, the mixture of distillate and solvent will then be moved over to the collection tank. The solvent will then be extra, uh, removed from the mixture uh, using the gas compressor and the condenser, and then the solvent will then be saved. And then the uh, distillate concentrate of that uh, marijuana plant can then be collected. Um, and then because they are using um, some uh, solvents that we do not want individuals to be consuming, it is actually a requirement in both AMA and SASA that each individual batch of a marijuana um, product 
is tested for residual solvents, including butane. All right. So uh, the different types of, uh, of edibles that we do see um, the most often um, or the most common edibles that we see are going to be um, your candies and your gummies. Those are definitely the ones that we see the most often being um, produced on a massive scale. We do still see some baked goods, cookies, brownies, cereal bars, stuff along those lines, but we just don't see them nearly as much. Um, one thing that is becoming a lot more popular is drinks, so lemonades, sodas, and iced teas that are infused with THC. Um, and then we don't really see them much. Then we might have maybe one or two marijuana kitchens in the state of Arizona that are trying to um, go a little bit more on the savory side. So there, um, there are a couple facilities that are making THC infused olive oils, um, hot sauces, salsas, um, or even like hot food. And by hot food, I mean like burgers, pizza, tacos, all of that. And then they will take a, um, a decarbed THC distillate and either put it on top of the product or infuse it actually when they're making the product itself. So in the state of Arizona, if, uh, if any facility is going to be working with marijuana in any kind of commercial aspect, uh, they will be, or they are required to be licensed uh, with at least some part of uh, ADHS. So that goes for the grow sites, that goes for the dispensaries, the manufacturing sites, the marijuana kitchens, and then the labs that even test um, test the marijuana. So obviously the uh, marijuana kitchen program is what I look over. We um, the, the kitchens are subject to two unannounced inspections a year. Uh, and then we uh, we do our inspections based off of the FDA food code um, and sanitation and all that. Um, the Our special licensing team, they are the ones that uh, do unannounced inspections on dispensaries as well as the grow sites and the manufacturing of uh, marijuana. They have their sanitation and general uh, rules that they do look over. Uh, and then our marijuana lab team does unannounced inspections on the labs that they don't grow marijuana, but they do receive in marijuana and they do all of the um, testing requirements for any uh, potential contaminants, whether that is um, microbial contaminants, um, heavy metals, uh, residual solvents or, or anything like that. Um, and then um, they have their various rules, violations that they can uh, write and then um, each each one of the teams um, has our own individual, um, I guess, reasons that we could um, issue a marijuana recall. So I'll be going over those now. So um, I'll be kind of going over our recall process since we've um, had several uh, marijuana recalls in Arizona now. Um, we have changed our process a little bit over time. Um, that's just because our SOPs have changed, but then we've also seen how things can uh, run a little bit smoother as we've um, kind of gone over everything. So the marijuana recalls, um, each individual team that I talked about, so marijuana kitchens, special licensing, or the lab team can have their own ways that um, they would need to start a, a marijuana recall. So at least on our end, we could be made aware that an individual um, it uh, contracted some form of illness or poisoning from uh, the ingestion of a marijuana product. Um, as of today, we have not received any information, um, whether that is an individual calling before a recall starts, letting us know that they, um, they believe that they got sick from the consumption of a marijuana product, um, or even after um, a recall has taken place. No, uh, no individuals have uh, informed us that they believe that they've gotten sick from the actual consumption of a marijuana product. Um, so as of today, um, there have been 10 recall press releases that have been issued by ADHS. Uh, ADHS. Um, when, I, when I do say 10 recall uh, press releases, um, a press release can contain uh, multiple businesses with multiple different products, or it contain as little as one product from one company. 
Um, so we've had a we've had maybe one or two where it's been one company and maybe one or two products, uh, but the vast majority of the recalls have been um, either four products from the same business or maybe even as much as four businesses with a total of 10 products that needed to be recalled. Um, and the way that these um, have been started is either by our special licensing team or our lab inspection team. So our special licensing team, the, the couple that they have um, found that needed to have a recall is during their routine inspections at um, any of their marijuana facilities, they review the lab testing results. They're referred to as certificates of analysis or C of A's. Um, they have reviewed some C of A's. The C of A's indicated that um, a product tested positive for a contaminant but then either it slipped through the cracks or it was ignored and it was um, sent out to them be sold. So they saw that, they let us know and we um, initiated a recall. Um, when it comes to the lab team, it can definitely be a little bit more complicated um, because most of the time when the lab team uh, triggers a recall, um, the C of A that is then provided shows that the product passed that it did not actually have any contaminant. Uh, but during their inspection, uh, they um, they have their processes and, and look through all of the different lab equipment um, and the back records for the lab equipment. If they see anything um, that would suggest um, a product is actually um, contaminated with a contaminant that is on the list in Ama and Sasa, um, they do a little bit of digging on their end, but then they actually contact the manufacturer of that piece of equipment to verify their claims. So it's not just a matter of they think something is, is um, contaminated, so we do a recall. They definitely do a lot more uh, digging on their end uh, to justify that even if they have a passing C of A, that no, this product is suspected to be contaminated, we need to um, put out a recall notice to make sure that the public is aware of, of what is going on. So once uh, we realize that a recall needs to happen, um, our end, we will send them a traceback questionnaire. So this is just a blank example of that. Um, the vast majority of this is um, going to just be used for our own records um, and just to get more of a gauge on the situation. So We'll obviously ask for some contact information, making sure that we can be um, very well um, in contact with everyone. We can get any updates or anything that we do need. Um, they can let us know if uh, there's anything in particular that they want to make sure that we are aware of. Uh, but then we just ask some general information of, did, did they produce the product? Did they buy it from somebody else? Um, how much of the product did they sell? Um, or do they have 100% of the products? Because if they do have 100% of the product, um, for obvious reasons, no message needs to go out to the public because it wasn't um, released and sold to the public, It, but it is still required to be held. It um, cannot be sold. Um, and then um, they would then need to follow their SOP to figure out, okay, what would be the next steps depending on the contaminant? All right. So... Um, notification and the uh, traceback questionnaire. So now when um, the when the initial word is given to us that a recall needs to take place, our special licensing team uh, will reach out to the facility, let them know kind of what is going on, um, what the suspected products are, um, all of that information, what the um, suspected contaminant is, uh, they will request sales records, and then they will ask them, uh, are you able to account for 100% of the product? And by account, I don't mean like, oh, do you know who you sold it to? It's, no, do you have 100% of the product? Because again, at the end of the day, if they haven't even sold it, then there's no message that needs to go out, um, but it is still required to be held and they cannot sell it. Um, so far for um, all of our recalls that we've um we've sent out uh, so far, they've all been uh, one of two contaminants. So the marijuana products have been contaminated with uh, either salmonella or aspergillus. Um, and uh, based on the rules um, that are in both Ama and Sasa, if a marijuana product is contaminated with salmonella, 
Um, the only required action is that it must be destroyed. Um, if it is contaminated with Aspergillus, so this is a very common fungus, um, there are a few different methods. So they can either destroy the product or remediate and retest. Um, and by remediate, um, they can send that product through a different process. Um, so it is very common to have flour, um, the actual flour of the marijuana plant contaminated with Aspergillus. And if that is the case, um, and it comes back positive for Aspergillus, um, that actual flower can be used to make um, a concentrate. So it can go through that whole extraction process. Um, and then that product needs to be tested again. Um, in a lot of cases that in that process will actually clear uh, the final product of um, Aspergillus contamination. So. <clears throat> So this is uh, just a small section of the testing requirements for all marijuana products uh, before they are being uh, sold. So uh, in both AMA and SASA, this can be found uh, in both, it is labeled as uh, table 3.1 and it goes over all of the testing requirements. So um, as you can see on, on the table, it shows uh, microbial contaminants and heavy metals, uh, but it also requires that they test for residual solvents, pesticides, fungicides, growth regulators, um, and potency. And then obviously um, potency isn't necessarily a contaminant, but it is, um, it's a requirement that they know the, pot the correct potency of all of their products. Um, obviously for edibles, because um, if it goes above 100 milligrams for the entire package, then it cannot be sold as a recreational product and they might need to do some modifications. Um, but then the ma the majority of it is, um, um, it's so the customers know what they are buying. And um, some facilities, I, I won't name who, um, but they there have been practices that have been found in the past to up the THC um, numbers on the actual test so they can put that on the label so then they can charge more uh, for that particular product. All right, so um, results of the questionnaire. So um, we'll, we will get the uh, questionnaire back and we will hold on to that. That does ask again, um, do they have 100% of the product? Even though that um, special licensing will ask, we do ask again just to solidify that. Um, and then just what other products do they um, use as in, you know, like fungicides, um, growth regulators, um, anything like that. Um, and then um, this is when the draft of the press, uh, press release will be made. And then that does get sent out. Um, so on our end, uh, the press release will get drafted. It gets combed over by um a lot of different people, and then it gets sent to our um, public information's office. Then the recall notice will get posted on our website. A notice will go out. It will get posted on our uh, social media accounts, and then it will also go out to um, various members of the media. Um, so on our end, that is a requirement. Um, we do ask the facility um, to post um, any kind of information that they that they do have, whether that is on a website or um, actually at maybe one of their facilities or at multiple of their facilities, uh, just because we understand that um, there are going to be some people that don't see our messaging, but they would see the um, the facilities messaging. And even though it is voluntary, we have had some facilities that do um, opt in and actually putting out that message to their customers, uh, you know, for the for the sake of their customers. All right, so just going over the general um, symptoms of salmonella. So salmonella is one of the two uh, major causes of marijuana recalls in the state of Arizona. So if someone um, is, uh, is exposed to and, uh, and is infected with salmonella, uh, they can expect diarrhea, fever, stomach cramps, vomiting, nausea, and headache. Um, and then when it comes to the, the mode of transport, uh, transportation of infection of salmonella, um, it can be uh, the flour itself can be contaminated um, as well as a concentrate or something, whether that is um, it was contaminated while growing, but if it went through a little bit more of a process, um, it could have been contaminated 
uh, by um, an employee that maybe didn't wash their hands or something along those lines. Uh, but the main um, mode of infection is going to be the handling of the contaminated product. So even if it's not inedible, they're handling that contaminated flour. They're getting the um, the salmonella contaminated product on their fingers. Um, they might, they're putting a, um, something, if they're smoking it, up to their lips, up to their mouth. They're breathing in. Um, and then they, obviously they would still have that salmonella contaminated a product on their fingers and then they could um, ingest that. And then that is uh, one way that they can be um, infected with salmonella from a uh, marijuana product. And then obviously if it is inedible, they're going to be orally ingesting that. And that, that's a little bit more of a clear cut um, uh, infection of salmonella. All right. And then um, aspergillus. So this is going to, this is the most common reason that we do have to issue a marijuana recall. Um, so an infection of aspergillus, um, an individual would expect to um, have fever, chest pain, cough, headache, shortness of breath. Um, so aspergillus <clears throat> is a very common uh, mold. It is found everywhere, inside, outside. Um, the average person bre uh, breathes in aspergillus spores every day. Um, there's about 180 different um, species of aspergillus, um, but only around 40 um, are known to actually cause infection. Uh, and then in Ama and Sasa, there's only four specific strains of aspergillus that um, are required to be tested for. Um, and then when it does come to um, those that are going to be more susceptible to aspergillus, it's going to be those individuals with either weakened immune systems or some other kind of uh, chronic or underlying health condition with their lungs um, or something along those lines. So think um, asthma, um, cystic fibrosis, if they have another like respiratory illness, if they have uh, tuberculosis um, or potentially a weakened immune system. So aspergillus was always a requirement uh, when it comes to testing for medical marijuana. Uh, you think of maybe potentially a cancer patient, their immune system is, is basically non-existent. So if they were to breathe in the spores of a, an infectious type of aspergillus that was um, in a marijuana product, they might be taking that marijuana product to help with any pain, to help with any nausea, to increase their appetite so they can actually eat. Um, when they do um, smoke marijuana, they could be breathing in those um, those spores um, that uh, from the plant that yet ha uh, hasn't been lit on fire. So they could be um, infected that way. And then this was actually the requirement that was added to recreational marijuana. So for about a year, a year and a half, when recreational marijuana was first legalized, Aspergillus was um, not one of the contaminants that needed to be tested only for recreational marijuana. Uh, but that was actually changed because uh, stakeholders and dispensary owners uh, actually um, to avoid confusion um, and other issues, they decided uh, to propose that asper aspergillus get added to the requirements for recreational marijuana as well. Um, so now the testing requirements for medical and recreational marijuana are exactly the same. All right, so um, results of the actual um, marijuana recalls. So once the um, recall notice does go out, the facility does have a few different options of what they can do. So they can follow the um, required action that is listed on table 3.1. So whether that is to destroy the product or to remediate and retest the product, um, they can do either one of those um, or they can actually have the product retested. <clears throat> so like I did say, every marijuana product is required to be tested before it is, be, uh, is sold. So it only needs to be tested once. But, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, but if, a, um, if a marijuana product comes up uh, that shows that it was contaminated with something that is listed on uh, on that table, they have the option to have that same sample sent to two different licensed marijuana labs and have it retested at those two um, labs separately. 
if both of their C of A's come back um, that say that the product is not contaminated with the, uh, the suspected contaminant, then the product can be released and then start to be sold again. Um, if this does happen, the facility can then send those C of A's to us and then we uh, we have in the past and we will con uh, continue to do it. Uh, we will release uh, an update to the uh, the recall. Uh, but if either one of those C of A's come back and it says that the product is contaminated, then the uh, the recall stands and then they would be required to uh, follow the required action that is in the, uh, the table. So remediate, retest or destroy the product. Uh, but yes, we have uh, we have issued updates to our recalls. So that is the main thing when it does come to these recalls is we do inform um, the customers. We do highly recommend that um, they either uh, discard the product, hold on to the product, but whatever they do, we do we do suggest that they do not consume the product because it could be contaminated with. Um, whatever was on the recall. So uh, again, as of today, it's only been salmonella and aspergillus, uh, but we do say that they should not consume it. So if they want to try, they can go to the facility that they bought the product from um, and they may uh, be able to get a refund uh, on that, but then they could hold on to it. And then um, uh, an update to the recall could be sent out and then they would be informed that um that the product is actually in fact safe and it's been proven to us to be safe. Um, and then actually on the uh, recall uh, press release that is sent out, the way that we um, identify and help the public identify the contaminated products is we'll give the product a name. So if that's the flower, that could be the strain of the flower. If that's a concentrate, it's the type of concentrate and the strain that's used. If it's an edible, it's maybe the flavor and the type that it is. So is that a gummy? Is it a chocolate or something along those lines? Um, we will get the product type. So is it flour? Is it a concentrate? What kind of concentrate is it? Is it wax? Is it shatter? Um, is it an edible? Okay, what type of edible is it? Is it a drink? A gummy, uh, you know, a cookie or something along those lines. And then each individual marijuana batch that is produced. Um, so any marijuana product, whether that is flour and edible concentrate in its final form, um, it is sent to a marijuana testing lab and it is given a batch number. Um, each batch has its own very specific number that is then posted on each individual package. And we do give out the batch number as well. So we say if all of these match up, then um, your product is subject to the recall. But if any one of these does not match, then it would not be subject to the recall. Because something to think about is um, the strains of the actual marijuana plant can be sold as the flower, but then that can be made into a concentrate or whatever, and they will have the same name, but it'll be a different product type. So um, if all of those match, then that product is subject to the recall. Um, and then that way the public knows. We do not give out um, where, the uh, where the products were sold, mainly to avoid any kind of confusion because depending on the size of the actual facility, uh, they can be selling all over the state. So instead of that, we opted in to just say, um, if you have any marijuana products that that um, even resemble what we are talking about, check it. And if it matches, we say do not, uh, you shouldn't be consuming it. Um, obviously, we don't have any uh, legal standing to say do not consume it, but we just highly recommend that they do not consume it uh, unless uh, a recall update is sent out and the product has been released. All right, so... Second part of my presentation, I will talk about the cottage food program uh, as of as it is right now, and then uh, what the potential future may look like. So, <clears throat> in 2011 was when the cottage food program was uh, created. It allowed individuals to register with ADHS uh, and produce certain types of shelf stable products uh, from their home kitchen and then sell. So those products are going to be uh, more commonly your breads, uh, cookies, cakes, and brownies, stuff along those lines. So anything that is shelf stable does not need to be kept under refrigeration and is seen as very low risk. Um, and then in 2018, uh, there were some changes that were made to the um, cottage food program. So it did allow 
uh, certain jams and jellies to then be made and sold as well. Um, and then it did require a food handler certificate um, as well. And then that is required when they actually do apply to be a part of the cottage food program. All right, so <clears throat> excuse me, the approved foods. Uh, this is actually uh, the list straight from our website. So it goes over the very common approved and non-approved foods. Um, we do still get a lot of people that ask um, if they're allowed to make cheesecake, tamales, what have you. And we say no. And then we do point them to the uh, the website. So really, it's anything that would need to be kept under refrigeration or uh, anything that needs a special process <clears throat> or um, or like any kind of like meat or anything along those lines. And then obviously the approved foods are going to be your very low risk foods. So dried spice mixes, dried pasta, roasted nuts, honeys, stuff along those lines where it is, it, it is um, low risk. So the uh, the very the most common approved foods that we do see spice mixes, brownies, cookies, um, anything along these lines, uh, cakes. There is a um, an asterisk on the cake mainly because of uh, frostings and icings. So there are some uh, frostings and icings that are uh, approved uh, based on uh, just what they are. So think sugar icing, candy clay glazes. Uh, gum paste and fondant uh, in their traditional form are considered shelf stable and they are um, approved. Uh, but then we do have some others. So royal icing, buttercream, ganache, they will use products that do make the um, the icing um, non shelf stable. So we do uh, we do offer some different substitutes that they may be able to use. They may opt in to use them or not. Uh, but if they decide to not, then they would not be allowed to make these um, specific frostings um, or icings. Um, and then if there is ever uh, an instance where it, maybe it's questionable um, if a product would be allowed or not, we have uh, information on our website that they can actually send their suspected product to a lab at uh, U of A. Um, and then uh, for a relatively cheap uh, cost, they will test the pH and the water activity of the frosting. Uh, and if it does meet the requirements to be considered non-TCS, uh, then they would be allowed to make that. Uh, but we do say that it is really mostly for just icings and frostings. We have had some uh, people that send in, say, like beef jerky or something, uh, and they send us the water activity and pH and say, hey, it's non-TCS. But because of the process, because of the actual product itself, it's still not allowed, even though it's uh, in a non-TCS form. So the most common uh, unapproved foods that we do get asked about, um, I mean, hot sauces, tamales is a really big one, salsas, meats, um, different types of cream-based or custard pies. Um, and then a lot of like seasonal stuff as well. So obviously right now uh, we're getting a lot of requests for pumpkin pie, uh, pecan pie, and maybe even like cheesecake because of the holidays and everything like that are coming up. Um, so we do say that they are not allowed to make it. If they do um, apply and they put any of these on there, we do, um, we do make sure that they see that they are not allowed to make it. We make them agree in writing that they... Um, that they will not be making it. And if they do decide to make it, they would be um, operating an illegal uh, food establishment because they are operating outside the scope of their um, cottage food registration. So the registration process uh, is entirely online. Um, and if, uh, and it is free, um, but um, like I did say a little bit earlier, they can send uh, suspected products to U of A to get tested that goes to U of A. So um, in most cases, food items uh, do not need to be tested, but in some of those cases, there, there might be a small fee that does go to U, uh, University of Arizona. Uh, but for um, us, there is no registration fee uh, for the cottage food program and everything is done online. So when someone does apply online, uh, it'll ask for some basic information. So uh, the name of the registrant, the home address, we do ask specifically for the home address because that is where the food product is going to be made. Um, so we cannot allow any like PO box or anything like that. 
um, and then some contact information like their phone number, their email address, um, the products that they're planning on making. Like I said, we do ask for the entire menu. We do get that in writing. And if they want to make anything that is not approved, uh, we get that in writing that they agree to remove that from their um, their menu. Uh, and then we do ask for a copy of their um, food uh, handler certificate as well. I mean, then we do review that. Uh, once everything does look good and there's no uh, there's no more questions, red flags or anything like that, they'll get an email that says that they have been uh, successfully registered with the cottage food program. Uh, on the left, you'll see that is what um, a blank cottage food uh, program uh, registration will look like. They will get a registration number and a date that they were um, registered uh, on, and then they'll get some uh, basic information on safe food handling, uh, and then um, some information on fats, oils, and greases. So just uh, obviously nothing that we can, um, we, we don't we don't really have much in the way of like follow up on, but still we want to get that information out because if you are going to be making food in your home, even though it is very low risk. We do still want them to do it in a uh, in a at least as safe of a manner as possible. Um, so when it comes to actually selling the cottage food uh, food items in the um, uh, just in general, they are allowed to sell them in the state of Arizona and strictly in the state of Arizona. Uh, so they are allowed to sell their products online, but they can only send them to uh, individuals in Arizona. They can sell them from their home. Uh, they can go to um, one of the more common ones is farmers markets in Arizona. Um, if that's the case, then they do need their um, registration with them so that they can show that um, their products were made in a home kitchen, uh, not subject to any kind of inspection. Um, and then before the product even leaves the home, it is required to be packaged and labeled. Um, so as of right now, our um, labeling requirements are on the top left. So um, it's required to have the common name of the product, uh, the name of the, regi uh, the registered uh, food preparer, the uh, registration number that's actually on their registration certificate, and then some kind of contact information, phone number or email. Uh, most individuals uh, opt in with just uh, putting on their email address. Um, and then we do require a list of ingredients, the pro uh, production date of the actual product, and then it, they do need this exact statement. So the product was produced in a home kitchen uh, that may process common food allergens um, and is not subject to public health inspections. So that's the big thing. So whether they're selling at a farmer's market, they are allowed to sell in uh, standard brick and mortar stores as well if they get um, permission from the um, owner of the facility. But the, the important thing is that the customers are made aware that this product is a cottage food product. It was made in a home kitchen and it is not subject to any kind of normal regulatory inspection. Um, but there are some changes that we are looking um, to make. Uh, so there, there are a couple other requirements uh, under the um, Arizona Department of Agriculture, uh, weights and measures. So um, we are looking to add uh, requirements to the labeling uh, that would be net weight of the actual product itself and a declaration of responsibility. So that would include either the address that the product was made or some kind of uh, website address. Um, so we are looking to actually add that. Um, those are some requirements that we do need to, um, to add to the labeling. All right, so registration and registrants for the Cottage Food Program has uh, definitely skyrocketed in uh, the last couple years. So um, like I said at the very beginning, the Cottage Food Program was uh, established in 2011, um, and it is still going strong as ever, uh, even today. So as of today, we have uh, 6,145 active registrants. That number might even be off too, because it is changing every day. Um, every day we have people um, applying as a brand new registrant, renewing their registration, or even letting their registration expire. Um, so as, uh, so even as, um, recent as last year, uh, we're averaging, we were averaging about 150 registrants per month. Um, but now, um, uh, interest for the cottage food program has gotten, gotten even more. So we're averaging, uh, just about 200 
per month, but we are seeing that steadily going up as well. Um, we did see a sharp increase um, around 2020 because people were um, losing their jobs or having to stay home. So uh, they were trying to supplement their income, uh, maybe needed something to do, have something on the side to um, to make a little extra money or something. Um, but we have definitely seen a lot of um, increased interest in the cottage food program. All right, so the potential future. Uh, so earlier this year, it was uh, it's House Bill 2509. Um, the media coined the term tamale bill uh, because that was probably the most popular food item that was gonna be added to be allowed to be made uh, in the cottage food program. Uh, so the tamale bill or HB um, 2509, uh, when we did look it over, um, it did not really go in depth at all when it comes to regulatory insight um, or oversight inspections or anything like that. Um, what it sounded like the, um, the goal of the bill was really only to expand the approved food items under the cottage food program. So no, uh, no added oversight inspections or anything like that. Um, but it would just open up the approved food items to um, meat, dairy, uh, cooked vegetables, really anything minus fish and shellfish. Those two were like uh, excluded from the actual bill. It straight up stated that um, it would not allow fish and shellfish. Um, so uh, this bill did definitely gain a lot of momentum and it, it drummed up a lot of press. Um, so then when the governor actually vetoed the bill, uh, there was a lot of um, outcry from the public. There was a lot of protests um, going on, and uh, there was actually an attempt to overturn the veto, uh, but that actually ended up failing. Um, so the, the veto did stand. So the uh, HB 2509 did not pass. So the Tamale Bill did not, um, did not go through. But this wasn't the first time something like this uh, made it, and this was the farthest that it did make it, and we were honestly really expecting that it would um, pass. Uh, so we are, all we can do is really be, um, we, all we can do is uh, speculate uh, for uh, the future. So really, we do hope that if something else were to come out, that they, um, that they look at the, the risk of the food items that they want to allow people to make. And then maybe look a little bit more into um, oversight and the of the public because that's the thing that does go um, that that goes overlooked a lot of the times is the cottage food program is the way it is right now because people are allowed to make food that is very low risk and safe. But if they were to do this, it brings a whole different level of risk to the the entire process. So again, we don't know what's going to happen. All we can really do is speculate, but we do really hope that um, if it does go, th if, if another bill is proposed, they do look a little bit more into the actual um, public safety aspect of, of any bill that is like this. All right, and then that is my time. That is my contact information if anyone uh, wants to get a hold of me for, for whatever reason. Awesome. Thank you so much, Travis. Learned quite a bit there. Um, we have quite a few questions. These are definitely some hot topics. So <clears throat> we're going to go ahead. We're going to get through as many of these as we can. And then um, if your question's not answered, you might have to try, uh, contact Travis directly, or maybe, yeah. uh, maybe we can do a wrap up some other way. But <clears throat> the top question right now, and we do want to just remind everybody, um, please ask your questions through Slido. We see a couple that are sliding through the cracks in the chat. We just want to keep the chat clear uh, so that it's visible for uh, like when people have like technical issues and stuff. Um, and when questions get posted in the chat, it gets a little bit, uh, we, we lose some of them. We lose, lose track of some of them. So we want to, want to make sure we can get to your questions if we can. Um, the first question is, are vendors required to post registration while operating? This is in reference to the uh, cottage food. 
Uh, yeah, so they are uh, required to um, have their registration posted in a conspicuous, so a very obvious um, area. And then again, it is required that it is on the um, label of the product before it even leaves the home kitchen. Uh, really, it just in every way, um, the public needs to be aware that it is a cottage food program, that it is not held to the same uh, safety inspections and uh, regulation standards as say like your standard uh, food establishment. So uh, yes. <clears throat> Perfect. Can the public view the marijuana inspection reports? If so, where or how? Um, so at least for the uh, marijuana kitchen um, reports, we don't have any kind of public facing website or anything to just uh, get those um, inspection reports. It does not mean that they aren't uh, available. So um, anything, any type of uh, documentation through ADHS can be requested through a public records request to, uh, through our Administrative Council and Rules team, or ACR. Um, so at least as of right now, that's the only way that you can get a marijuana inspection report. But you can, uh, there is ways to actually get it, yes. Perfect. Um, I was told by a couple cottage food licensees that anything that has jalapeno in it is automatically denied. Is this true? If so, why? Um, so, uh, yes. Uh, main, uh, so when it comes to any kind of produce, if it's whole and it's not cut, then it would be allowed. Um, if it is, um, but it is one of the few types of, um, it gets brought up a lot mainly because of jams and jellies. Um, everyone wants to make jalapeno jelly, um, and that is denied. Um, the main thing is because we don't allow any kind of cut or, um, yeah, any cut produce. So when it does come to any type of produce that someone wants to make, um, it needs to stay whole. So they, they would be allowed to sell it in its whole form and not, uh, uh, cut or anything like that. But once they cut it and process it, um, no, that would not be allowed. Correct. Does ADHS monitor CBD products? If not, does anyone? Um, as of right now, um, no, not not really. So when it does come to industrial hemp, um, that is overseen by the um, Arizona Department of Agriculture. Uh, but once the product is harvested, they are um, completely hands off. And then they, uh, as as far as my knowledge is, they are the only. Uh, agency with any kind of oversight for industrial hemp. Um, and then that's the the main producer of CBD. So CBD is also in uh, your standard marijuana products, but it is a natural uh, product of that marijuana uh, plant. So that is overseen by uh, the three teams that I did talk about a little bit earlier, uh, but CBD, not so much. Um, and we are waiting on a more official stance on uh, CBD as a whole from our higher ups here at the state. So, perfect. Um, how or who does the potency verification for edible products? Uh, years ago during an FDA conference, they mentioned that there was no approved method to verify edible doses. Uh, yeah, so that is actually part of the potency requirements uh, when it comes to the testing. So on that table. 3.1, uh, the very last um, section is for potency. So um, like I said, every individual batch of a marijuana product, whether that's the flower or edible or what have you, gets sent to these labs and uh, they do test for, uh, for potency in the actual final product of, um, of the marijuana product. So uh, when it does come to... Um, the exact potency, it will fluctuate slightly uh, depending on the packaging and all that. I mean, um, for a lot of edibles, it'll either be infused directly in the product or they'll actually infuse sugar that the, uh, the candy will be rolled in. And then that's how the THC um, it is a part of the product. Uh, but the marijuana testing labs that are licensed through ADHS, they do test uh, for the potency. And a lot of that is uh, for um, advertising. Oh, well, I, I say advertising, but um, labeling actually in the facility itself. And then also, yeah, that is to uh, ensure that they are in line with the um, the requirements, the potency uh, 
limits for recreational versus medical marijuana. Awesome. And then it looks like we have time for maybe one more. We're pushing on time here. So uh, last question, is there some sort of limit on the amount of food sold through the cottage food program? Can people run a huge operation from home? Uh, so uh, there is no limit on the amount of food that can be made in the cottage food program. Uh, but we, uh, we, we are very specific that it has to be made in the home kitchen. So it cannot be made in any commercial kitchen or anything like that. It has to be made in the home uh, kitchen. So if as long as that is the case, then they can make as much as as they want. So, yeah, there really is no no limit. Awesome. Um, like I said, uh, unfortunately, that's our last question for this. We've got a ton of questions on this topic, and unfortunately, we're running a little bit late here. So we'll go ahead and let Travis go. Thank you so much, Travis, for such a great and informative presentation. And we'll move on to the next one. Awesome. Thank you. If you have a really, really pressing question, if your question wasn't answered, uh, feel free to contact Travis and uh, we can get you an answer on that. Other than that,